So uh, when I was asked to do this, um, I had no idea of the, the frantic journey of reading and learning that I would set upon um, to, I suppose, familiarise myself with the, with the topics. And now I have to say that sitting here with Micheline Sheehy Skeffington and Helen Pankhurst, that I, I feel like I'm actually touching history. I'm in the presence of history. Micheline Sheehy Skeffington, as you all know, is the granddaughter of Hannah Sheehy Skeffington and Helen Pankhurst, the granddaughter of Sylvia Pankhurst and the great-granddaughter of Emmeline Pankhurst, who in 1999, Time magazine named Emmeline as one of the 100 most influential women of the 20th century. So now, I'm not going to do the really long biographies on both of you. Suffice it to say that Micheline Sheehy Skeffington, as she says herself, comes from a long line of troublemakers. <laughs> and she has devoted her life, I suppose, to preserving that legacy, and she has fought her own battle, as you know, on um, female academics and the position of female academics. <laughs> And Dr. Helen Pankhurst is a very busy woman. I'd say your feet never touch the ground. She's a best-selling author. She's also a women's rights activist and an international development activist with a, a big interest in Ethiopia, which is where Sylvia ended up. So we, we'd like to hear about that as well. So um, let's get started. What I really want to do for the audience here today, because I'm not sure how much they know, I want to just you know get a picture of your grandmother. So Micheline, can you just tell us a, a bit about Hannah to start off with? Well, Hannah came from uh, a, li a long line of troublemakers. Her father, David Sheehy, and her uncle, Eugene Sheehy, went to prison several times for Fenian and then Land League activities. Um, but her mother also was a very strong woman, and her aunt, her mother was Bessie McCoy, and Kate Barry, who became Kate McCoy, who became Barry, were also strong women. And I learned recently from the McCoy family that Bessie McCoy defied the local priest as a teenager. Um, because he refused to say the rosary and for to prayers for her, the people incarcerated in Kilmainham for Fenium activities, and her, that included her brothers. Um, so she said, right, I'm going to get the keys of the church in Ballyhahill. This is in County Limerick, near Tarbert, but in Limerick. And uh, I'll lead the rosary in, in, at six o'clock this evening. And that's a teenager, to find the priest. So I think Hannah had role models in, in her mother and in her Aunt Kate Barry. Her Aunt Kate took her to see her Uncle Eugene in prison in Kilmainham. And when Hannah was four took her up from Lockmore and Tipperary where they lived and brought her up. So I think that's where she got her interest in, in nationalist activism, in the socialist aspect of the Land League and then she had a sense of being equal and wanting to make a change and her, her education was equal to that of her brothers and it was really I think only when she went to university in her words she was amazed and disgusted to find she hadn't got the vote and you know how can I make a difference if I haven't even got that fundamental right the vote and threw herself into the fight for the vote. But uh, after the women achieved the vote, just to move through that whole suffrage thing, which we'll deal, deal with, she says the vote is but a symbol, and until women have overcome all the taboos and all the things that are against them, then they will not be equal and we will not have emancipation for, for humankind. So she saw that as just a symbol, as a step towards it. And as we know, we're still fighting a lot of these things. And I like the word taboos because the, the recent referendum to enable abortion to be um, available uh, is, is one huge step forward and, and putting to bed both <laughs> And Helen, could you tell us a little bit about Sylvia, please? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so, similarly, a family of radicals, uh, the middle daughter, uh, both Emmeline, her mother, and uh, Richard, her father, very much involved in radical Manchester, uh, many ideas there, uh, fervent ideas about change and social justice. Um, and I think the interesting thing in terms of Sylvia's story is... The t is that it's one of unity around issues of social justice and in particular women's rights but it's also a story of divisions within the family as differences of opinion emerge as to how to do this. So as the middle daughter um, she found herself uh, beginning to disagree with some of the tactics, some of the ideas, some of the end goals 
that her mother and older daughter, uh, Christabel and Emmeline, uh, they were shifting in a certain director, she, direction, she and another. Uh, I think the other, the, for me, the fundamental uh, interesting factors around Sylvia are that she went beyond the ideas of the vote, uh, linking to your point about the symbol, really, mm. beyond the idea of the vote as the be-all and end-all, Yes, a strategic, really important aspect, but she was always aware of the practical realities of women's lives, particularly working in the East End of London, and understanding that you had to look at the campaign for the vote, but also you needed to address issues such as um, poverty, and uh, therefore she was involved in converting a pub, uh, the Gunners' Arms, into the Mother's Arms, a creche. Um, <laughs> Uh, creating a low-cost uh, restaurant where you could combine a lot of uh, resources to provide cheap uh, uh, food, uh, looking at all sorts of practical constraints and doing the two together. Also disagreements within the family about what the role of men should be in all of this. Is this a campaign in which women lead and it's about women and only women and men's role is in support or how exactly and the different aspects of the family disagreed. They also disagreed on issues around empire and um, uh, Ireland. They disagreed on issues around the, um, uh, the First World War. I would not like to have been in that family. There's a lot of arguments. But, but what it does, the question that I have is there was obviously so much political discussion in both their families. What was it at the time that had everybody involved in discussing tactics and ideologies? I mean, nowadays, I suppose we know how other family members vote in, in, in a particular referendum or, or whatever, but we don't, you know, the, I, I don't think we have that same level of discussion. What was happening back at that time? And we're talking about the early 1900s, really, around 1910. Mm-hmm. That time? Well, that would be when Hannah was a student, like growing up. But even uh, you know, in the, in that family, it, to bear in mind that her father and her uncle and her mother were born around famine times, so they saw the immediate after effect of that. And I think that really politicised people. And the Land League was came out of that. So there was, I think that was a crucial turning point. And then people who had the time and obviously the energy and the money and survived the famine put their efforts into that. Uh, so there was a, that was a strong family discussion. But then, yeah, uh, as, as Hannah graduated in, in the university, I remember also that the women couldn't attend the same lectures as the men. Mm-hmm. And my grandfather, Francis, wrote one of his first publications was to talk about the university question, as it was called. A forgotten aspect was the fact that women hadn't equality in the universities. Mm-hmm. And they couldn't even attend the societies. So they so would meet afterwards in the, in the they library? They would meet in the letters. library or in the Sheehy home where there was a lot, you know, Hannah had several, two brothers and three sisters so there was quite a lively interaction there and and they would meet otherwise but you know that whole yeah and and I think it was an interesting time I mean women had only just in the last 20 or so years got access to university you know and I think there was a kind of an intellectual movement you know with Tom Kettle and the volunteers and all the leaders you know there was I think there was an opening of the mind there seemed to have been a kind of opening out and inclusivity of women then I mean that's as far as I can have a sense you know perhaps because it's a more recent time we don't know more but I think there was a more middle class movement Mm -hmm. inevitably people who went to university and otherwise it was discussions and and it must have been a really vibrant time yeah and would you say the same in London I mean so this was Manchester and I would say it's the industrialization it's uh, an urban setting in that context um, and interestingly large families families where you can have that discussion you know um, the relationship between the political space and the family space I think really really interesting in that um, we assume politics happens outside well in these cases politics happened within the family and I think it's those discussions and the personal uh, realities of that that plays into these stories um, you know how often do we think about larger families in the story of change we just identify we just pick a certain person and say it's that person that created change uh-uh the, I think the family dynamics the social dynamics the communities mm. absolutely critical in the storyline. And um, Micheline, was everybody in the suffragette movement in Ireland, would they all have been educated in the sense of university education? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think the majority were, um, but uh, <laughs> they were, you know, not all had degrees by any means. I mean, one of the things you, you see sometimes is images of the, the women who had degrees with the graduation gowns, because it was really important to show actually we can get degrees, we are actually intelligent, but not everybody did, you know, there was a whole range of people but I think it was more or less confined to the middle classes just because they had more money and time 
But there were different strains of interest, and of course there was the nationalist question, and Constance Markowitz and Nina Hare and Maud Gunn were saying, let's wait till we have independence. Why are you fighting for the vote in, in a foreign parliament? And my grandmother Hannah said, yeah, I really want independence, but I'm actually not going to drop the vote. You know, So there was the, those kinds of tensions, as well as you know, try, trying to be inclusive with, with people in you know, the working conditions in Dublin and living conditions. But I think it was more about getting the vote first. Yeah. As far as I can tell, I mean, I'm not... And of course the cultural either. revival, or what we call the cultural revival, was ongoing at the time as well. So there yeah. was a lot of activity, people joining organisations yeah. like yeah. the Gaelic League and the GAA. Mm-hmm. And so it, it was just a very active time. But uh, Frank and Hannah... When they got married, they took each other's names. Mm. And, of course, that was way ahead of their time, really, wasn't it? Were they sort of out to, to shock? Was that kind of what was going on? or was it... I don't think so, no. I, I, they just did it, because that was an equality thing. You know, like, Frank became interested in feminism age 11. You know, so it was like, this is natural. Of course we have each other's name. And the Skeffington family was a little bit put out, you know, diluting a good family name. The <laughs> Sheehys took it in their stride. <laughs> but, you know, it is interesting. And I should I ask the members, the male members of the audience, how many actually took their wives' names when they got married? You know, it was quite unusual. And it's a feminine. We were just talking about that because I just realised, of course, that Helen's the granddaughter of Sylvia Pankhurst, and yet she's called Pankhurst. So... That you yeah. might want to say about yeah, so in, in our case the story is that uh, Sylvia didn't want to change her surname because of all the feminist stories around that but also her partner was an anarchist an anarchist didn't believe in marriage um, <laughs> but furthermore he was an Italian so had she married him uh, she would have lost the right to vote so you know why would she give up all of the things that she fought for. Right, okay. Kind of harkens back, I suppose, to women here who lost their right to work when they got married until actually, what was it, up in the 1960s? Um, 70s, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, So obviously they were ahead of their time, both women. Now, Sylvia was very interested, really, in socialism and in helping the poor, so she sort of deviated from the rest of the family. She sort of moved away from what the rest of the family were doing in that sense. Tell us a little bit about her journey. She, yeah, well, she would say that it's her mother and daughter who deviated because originally they were very radical left-thinking family. Richard Pankhurst, Emmeline's husband, um, you know, had stood for the ILP, the Independent Labour Party. Um, but uh, the, Christabel and Emmeline felt that tactically... Uh, you, the most important thing was to get the foot in the door and therefore to get some women the vote and the people that you needed to get in were those who were most articulate and those who had the least to lose and could actually stand up you know, uh, could be asked to, do, to sacrifice in the way that a working class woman w- w- needed to protect herself and the family and could do that so their logic was that uh, it was more important to focus on some women, the most entitled, and I think gradually that took them to a very conservative place, whereas Sylvia felt that fundamentally this, the, most, the people who needed it the most were those who that were the most poor and who, where the inequalities, the economic inequalities were most great, as they are today. You know, there was that sense that that was the logic of it. Furthermore, she disagreed with the militant tactics in many ways, feeling that actually this was about voice and democracy and that that was the way to... Uh, uh, to to ensure change rather than just follow the leader in the most um, violent tactics. So there was a disagreement. Yet she was one who was jailed and force-fed on hunger strike more than any of the others in the family. uh, Yes, because I think she also felt that she, I think, took a while to separate or actually be expelled from the family. And I think um, she still felt that there was the need for direct action but just the weight of, of who does what and, and how they do it, I think she disagreed with. Mm. Um, and so it, it, the, the, the kind of the socialism inherent in the way that she approached things actually, I think, carries through over time. Yeah, and I'm surprised, I suppose, reading, reading back the level of militant action that, that the women in both countries took part in. I mean, Hannah took part in militant action. She was jailed several times. Mm. Um, was she, she was also on hunger strike. Tell us a little bit yeah, about well, what, what the women went through. Yeah, story. Yeah, they, yeah. I, I do say, you know, I, when I took my case, I was thinking my grandparents put their lives not only on hold, but in danger, you know, for what and Hannah, go, by going on hunger strike, she probably shortened her life. You know, so it, this is kind of the, the legacy we have. Yeah. 
And um, that actually, the hunger strike started because there were two English suffragettes came over while they were in prison um, because Prime Minister Asquith came over and they, they got in prison. They, one of them threw a hatchet at the carriage. And then because that was what they were at, the, at um, Asquith and John Redmond's carriage um, and so they were sentenced and put in prison and then they went on hunger strike because that was what they were doing in Britain already. Um, but they, this was the first, they were in prison for their first direct action in, in Ireland for breaking the windows, as, as was mentioned earlier. Um, and then they thought, gosh, you know, there was a bit of tension. They, they didn't quite like the fact that English suffragettes were coming mm-hmm. over and taking, you know, they, they set, tried to set fire to the Theatre Royal. And the Irish suffrage movement were kind of trying to keep the Irish public on their side. Um, so they were saying, well, we don't quite agree with the tactics, but we should show solidarity. So that's, it, they were kind of forced into it. And I think it's interesting to, I don't know yet about the um, historical, but it seems the first people to go on hunger strike in Irish prisons were two English women. Okay. You know, the two, Mary Lee and Gladys Evans. Yes. Um, but then the, the four Irish women who had shorter sentences, uh, Hannah writes in her uh, memoirs, where I should have brought them, Margaret Ward's brought out her, her memoirs, she kind of ruefully says, oh, the women who broke the windows in the custom house got a longer sentence. I, I, you know, we only got <laughs> two months. But as a result, there was four of them that had only five days left, and they decided to go on hunger strike in solidarity. And what was interesting was Hannah said one of the things she dreaded was when she heard uh, footsteps coming down the corridor, were they going to come and force feed her? You know, because that was what was happening already in Britain. Um, but she had stuck out the five days. They each individually apparently were told that the others had given up, but they hadn't. They just stuck it out. And there's actually a photo of her being released looking triumphant. As soon as they released the four hunger striking Irish women, they force fed the English women. And I, I think that was interesting. They weren't to know then, but it was interesting that they never dared force feed Irish women who were hunger striking on Irish soil. They didn't mind English women, you know, and again, there's these tensions between nationalism and, you know, they could do that and it didn't have much effect, but the the authorities, which were British, didn't dare force feed Irish women. They did, I think, a few times in Britain when they were in hunger strike in Britain, but never there. And yet they were able, they, they saw fit to force feed for a long time the two English women that time. And Helen, just the same question to you. I mean, there must have been a huge level of frustration for the women to put themselves through this. Mm-hmm. There was one woman I read, and I just can't remember the name now, you probably know it, where she threw herself mm-hmm. under the king's horse yeah. um, and, and, and killed yeah. herself. I mean, what, was, what were they feeling to do that? Yeah, you know, that level of frustration is really interesting because you can talk about, the, we, there was that talk about gradualism versus, you know, at what point do you say enough is enough? And I think they'd had, you know, 50 years of campaigning, 16,000 petitions, nothing much was happening. And I think there comes a point in everybody's life where you just have to say enough is enough and you start doing something differently. So that's what happened. And their first act wasn't actually that... Um, that revolutionary. It's just that they kept on being told this is not important, all the rest of it. So um, two women across class differences, um, so Christabel Pankhurst and Annie Kenny, decided to interrupt a meeting. And they also, for the first time, used that summary votes for women. So they created the first banner with just that, that the hashtag of their day, if you will. They shortened it to votes for women. Um, and uh, knowing that uh, what they were doing was ratcheting things up a bit and that they would possibly be uh, imprisoned as a consequence. So they did just that. They brought out their votes for women in the campaign. They were chucked out. Um, uh, Christabel spat at a policeman. Now, she did this knowing, having studied law, and knowing that, therefore, she would have to be taken to court okay. and she would be imprisoned. And then you have the beginnings of the prison, the being imprisoned, and then gradually it matches up from there. But I don't think they ever started off mm-hmm. thinking okay. that this is going to be the level of sacrifice that's required of them. And you know, at what point in societies do things start to turn? And I'm interested in that because I started to write this the book. This book? Yeah, and this we, book? we will get on to, um, to talk about that. About uh, just over two and a half years ago. And I, I wrote it thinking some people would be interested in the, the fights, you know, that some yeah. people interested be in centenary. And since then, if you look at what's happened over the last two years in terms of this growth in fed upness around the, uh, the rate of change in terms of women's rights and this fear of the rise mm-hmm. of dinosaurs and the unaccountability in so many countries. I think there's something else. It's, I mean, it's, it's different, but there's certain times in history people just say, enough, 
Do you think we need to, to get back to being militant then? And we, we well, will talk about that. I think we're, we're beginning to see enough people that are fed up with change and, yeah. and, and direct action is re-emerging, actually. Just to go back a bit, World War I, how did Hannah and Frank deal with World War I? Yes. It was seen as a kind of an interruption, all down tools, you know, um, but they did not. No, they didn't. Well, uh, you know, it, it was seen by many of the Irish as, as being a British war. Frank was a militant pacifist. Some people confuse the word pacifism with being passive. He was anything but so. His, he, the Irish Citizen, which he'd founded, which was a suffrage newspaper, which in itself was a statement of independence because they weren't citizens yet, um, came out with the poster, Votes for Women Now, Damn Your War! <laughs> and he went on to make speeches every week against the war and against recruitment. Again, you know, so he was very much against it. And therefore, there was a sense: well, it's not really our war. We're going to continue fighting for the for the the, the vote. And I think that, that's where there was a split in the Pankers as well. Yes. But um, you know, the Irish also saw it. I mean, obviously, there were Irish who saw, joined up as soldiers for various reasons in the British Army. But there was a lot that saw, no, this is not our. War. Yeah, so we continue with our campaign. Yeah. And Helen, th- th- it did divide the family, the war. Didn't yes, it? it did divide the war, and Sylvia was a pacifist when it came to the First World War. But interestingly, by the time of the second, she had identified the dangers of fascism. She visited uh, Italy and was very clear that a different response was needed to that. And I think a lot of the women who were involved in uh, this whole fight and this awakening about their own uh, uh, issues uh, were very sensitive to broader political uh, phenomena over time. So you see them being involved Mm -hmm. right throughout, including um, in international uh, international, uh, solidarity when it comes to the Second World War. Okay. And um, in terms of, there were also, not every woman supported the suffragettes. They're what were called the antis that I was reading about and jeering. I just want to read one paragraph because I thought this was funny. Um, it was from an article that Cleena Murphy wrote and Hannah Sheehy Skeffington is talking about a visit to Carrick and Shannon, which is where I'm from, where there was, quote, a howling, raging mob led by a drunken virago. In spite of Lent, in spite of the proximity of the church, they paraded the space before the hotel, that has to be the Bush Hotel, creating a pandemonium for over two hours with motor bombs, savage yells, obscene jeers and mock suffrage orations. So the women who who put themselves out there and who spoke, they really had to put up with an awful lot, didn't they? Yeah, I think they they did. I mean, there were men and women that jeered at them. But why did other women not support them? Oh, I don't. Well, you know, there's a whole. You know, it's the same today, isn't it? There's a lot of people. <laughs> No, the, it generally, if you if you put yourself out there and you want to do something different, people are happy enough. Not all, everybody, but people are happy enough with the status quo. Mm. And if you put yourself out there and you want to change, people don't like that. You know, what are you doing interfering with the home or the whatever? And why would so? You know, and people, women and men, would in, incorporate a bit of the the social. All oh, women aren't able for this. You know, this whole thing about disruptiveness. You know, society dictates and not everybody would be, you know, in, in favour of it. Yeah, it takes thinking through and having confidence too. I mean, that's where I come back to Hannah growing up with the, in a family where she was obviously treated as an equal. She felt she, had, she could contribute. She, you know, she had role models in her mother and her aunt. That's really unusual. You know, and I think it's the same myself. I didn't kind of become that aware of feminism until kind of later on because I never saw the difference of odd things happened in school but then you realise my god there's so much you know to do and, and just to stand out and then say well okay I have to do something when I can, when I can. yeah you know? and Helen just before we move off sort of the historical part of it um, just tell us about Sylvia's later life and where she was eventually led yeah uh, so uh, she took on one cause after another after the East End of London and being actually really, really prominent in the, the kind of socialist spaces. They're more, Lenin quotes her, talks about her more than any other British politician or British uh, campaigner, which is slightly bizarre, really, when you think of her as a suffragette. Um, and then uh, Italy invaded Ethiopia and she took this as an act of aggress- aggression um, but nobody else particularly took up this as a cause. We'd had the Spanish Civil War, and there 
um, a lot of people did support um, the, the you know, issues of freedom of um, free Spain, but because this was Africa, nobody really was, was saying very much, so she took up that cause and started to campaign on the issue and was vilified um, for it. There's one amazing letter. I mean, talk about um, these... Uh, you know the, the the violence to and the language with which women are treated, um, uh, you, you know, uh, in different contexts. So I just wanted to share with you. This is one letter. Uh, where am I? Uh, here we go. Uh, here we go. So this is a letter addressed to uh, Sylvia. Um, and it goes, Madam Pankhurst, Three Charteris Road, Woodford. The invasion of England will take place in a few days. We shall punish you by order of our leader, as you well deserve, for the article in your filthy paper against the Italian fascists. Your house in Woodford will bombed and burned to the ground. Hitler knows your address. You will pay with your life. If you publish any name in your paper, do not dare to go out in the dark. You will murdered. Heil Hitler, viva Mussolini. And this was from the Italian London fascists. So the kind of uh, the aggression uh, for speaking out in those areas. To cut a long story short, she ended up um, spending most of her life in Ethiopia. Well, spending the last uh, days of her life in Ethiopia, campaigning for a greater understanding of the cultural beauty and value of Ethiopian heritages, uh, as well as some developmental issues. And was given an Ethiopian state funeral, I read, when she died. What an extraordinary woman. Mm -hmm. And Sylvia, um, Hannah, uh, she had a rather sad life because Mm. Frank was murdered. Mm, Tragically, yeah, in 1916, the rising. I mean, ironically, he was a pacifist. He was a non-combatant. He was very much conflicted. You know, I've heard my father say this on on the radio and recording. Um, when the rising broke out, because he really wanted the revolution, you know, he supported a lot of the aims, but he just couldn't, you know, he had an open letter to Thomas McDonough, um, one of the signatures of the proclamation, saying, can you not conceive of a body of people with one single aim and objective, but which did not have as its fundamental you know, aim uh, to kill your fellow human beings? And then, ironically, he was taken in and held uh, illegally because he was in charge by Captain Bowen Colthurst and taken out as a hostage in the evening and witnessed the murder of a boy by Colthurst. Himself pulled out a pistol and shot the boy. Can't go into all the details. But Hannah never knew what happened to him for ages. She was never told officially what had happened. Um, And then the house was raided two days after Frank was murdered for evidence against him. And one of the things that we... I have an image of is a child's drawing because my father Owen was seven at the time, you know, and he had drawings of zeppelins and you know yeah. German ships and that. And this was evidence that they were German sympathisers, you know. And there's a signature on the thing. And I, I, I heard since uh, actually, I think it was Molly who's here told me that if somebody gave a talk, that actually the only legitimate way to ex- execute people was if you were German sympathisers. So a lot of the leaders in 1916 possibly were not justified in being executed, but this was the proof that he could, should have executed Frank. Um, but of course, it was complete. It was just you know this, uh, he had witnessed the murder, and then he had uh, Coulthard must have realised this man is outspoken. He's a pacifist. He's a journalist. I have to get rid of him. And then he took Thomas Dixon and Patrick McIntyre out from where they'd been taken in. They were journalists. Just happened to be taken in in a raid. They weren't part of the revolution, and they were shot. So this man who was sentenced eventually guilty, but insane. Hannah always maintained he wasn't insane. Mm. He was obviously acting completely out of order and out of orders, but he had reasoned, and that's my thinking, that you know, he's witnessed this murder of boy, therefore I must get rid of him, I right. must get rid of anybody else. So that all happened, and it, the, then Hannah, um, there was a court martial eventually, he'd, he wasn't arrested for a while, and Hannah was unhappy with this verdict, let alone the, the evidence given, and she called for a full public inquiry, and she went to ask with and asked him for this, you know, and of course he says, no, you know, it's wartime, you can't have a complete thing. I'll give you £10,000. And she just ignored that completely. She didn't even hear the sum. That's about the equivalent of three quarters of a million euro today. Oh my God. And she just said, I'm not interested in hush money, I'm interested in the truth. I want the whole truth. And they did have an inquiry, but again, key witnesses like it Coulthurst fudge, and that yeah. were not there. And she, so ended she up going then to America then said, to "I'm going story. to America," and yeah. she, the British wouldn't give her a passport. <laughs> she had to pr- say that she wouldn't talk about the war, about Britain or Ireland. So, so she went to Glasgow uh, uh, under disguise, and Margaret Skinner's family provided her with a, uh, a false passport, and she took her on the persona Mrs. Mary Gribbon. 
for the journey over. And that's what's real. That's why the, last year it was a hundred years on. She gave her first speech in Carnegie Hall. Uh, you know, talking it was a memorial for Francis Sheehy Skeffington. There were a lot of people who knew him. He'd been over there the previous year, and it filled. She filled Carnegie Hall. So I went over a hundred years on to just try and recreate that because she's well known, and I think it's a bit like Sylvia, perhaps well known as a suffragette. You know, Pankhurst yeah. suffragette. She's Skeffington suffragette. But actually, she did this whole journey on her own with with Owen, her yeah. her son, with no money because she didn't even tell her job. She gave them the slip. She left the country and arrived in New York. She didn't even know she was going to be let in. They didn't rumble to this Mary Gribbon, so as soon as she got to New York, full press conference, Hannah Sheehy's Skeffington. I'm not at liberty to say how I got here. <laughs> and then she went on to get the support you know, of the Irish Americans for 18 months, and I think that's quite yeah. a thing. And Owen was your dad. And Owen was and my father. saw all that happening. Yeah. It's, it's no wonder... You, you two are dripping in history. Yeah. So we're going to move it on a little bit to 100 years, where have we come? You've written a book, Helen. How are we doing? Uh, so, um, uh, um, what I decided to do is look thematically. How, have we do- how are we doing in politics? How are we doing economically? How are we doing in terms of women's sense of self and identity and cultural ideas about women? How are we doing in violence? How are we doing in culture? How are we doing in power? And I decided to look at each of those. And I was interested not just in how are we doing in each of those, but also can we compare and what happens if we put it all together? Um, and uh, I mean, I'm really tempted to try something very, very quickly. Mm. So politics here, what would you say? Zero would mean no change. Five would mean we've got equality. Two, three, four, somewhere in between. Fingers up. Let's see what you think here in Ireland. I'm seeing twos, twos, ones, twos, ones and twos. Okay, a, a few that were higher. My second chapter looks at economics, so women's financial autonomy, work and so on. What do you say? The same thing, fingers up. Uh, twos, threes, I'm, I think you're going higher, yeah. uh, the odd fours. My third chapter is on women's identity, so their sense of self, issues of um, sexual reproductive rights, um, the relationship with their families, what's going on in the domestic sphere. What do you think? Uh, ones, it's going down again, although there's the odd four. Um, violence against women, what do you think? Okay, definitely lower, without any doubt lower. Um, I could go on, but but that's interesting because for me as well, I felt that with uh, violence, even although legislative, there are lots of legislative changes, even although some facilities have increased, a lot of those were decreased with austerity. Um, Fundamentally, violence still infects uh, the chapter on politics. In in the UK, it's Joe Cox murder that comes to mind and all the Twitter campaigns and all of that. Violence in the workplace, me too. We know how rife that is in all workplaces. Violence at home, yes, changing a bit, the kind of the slap, the acceptability of some of that changing, but in so many other ways, the the kind of power imbalances at home manifesting itself in terms of control, still there. Violence in all our cultural spaces, the books that we read, the plays that we we see the cinema, the, so much of it still infects. So I felt that violence uh, was pushing us down in many ways. But so having said that, I think you know, universally for me, there has been progress, but it is one step forward, two step backwards, or two step forwards, one step backwards in so many ways. And they're interlinked, so you can't resolve one problem without addressing others. Let me just share with you briefly a couple of the quotes that have kind of stuck with me from some of the uh, conversations going up and down the country because I literally I've been walk, I've been yeah. all over the place in the UK and and elsewhere um, and just the other day uh, I was in uh, Todmorden which is um, just west just east of um, Manchester and it's the last point I'll make sorry um, yeah, there was a teacher there and she said that uh, this was for 14 year old girls. Uh, sorry, 14 year old students and they made a list of the key uh, issues that maybe kids might want to be addressing in order to make their lives a bit easier and on there uh, the detox from social media was one of the lists, mm-hmm. one of the items not one boy ticked that as one of the issues that concerned them more than 80% of the girls ticked that point as an issue that concerned them. So just to say that the reality of women's experiences shifts and change and morphs, but the fundamental reality is we're not there yet. Okay. 
Do you think we're in a new wave of feminism? And you refer in your book to the four waves, and I don't want you to go into all of them. Yeah. But with the whole Me Too yeah. campaign and that that we've seen in the last couple of years, are we in a new wave of feminism? We are, but I, I, would, I would want to get rid of that cold wave analogy because I think it is problematic in many ways. And I think that uh, definitely there's something going on in terms of the activism of <laughs> feminists, male and female. And I think it's really important, you know, coming back to that fact that anybody, a woman can be retrograde in terms of ideas of gender or a man can be progressive. But I think that there is a lot of activism on that space. There is a lot of sense of we have to have equality around gender sexuality, colour, all of those issues. Many people are occupying that space and, and active in it. And at the same time, there is so much that's pushing us backwards. Micheline, um, tell us about your own campaign uh, with NUIG. Yeah. Just remind us, I suppose, briefly of where you, how far you've come with that and well, how, long, yeah. how long it's taken you. Yeah, it's well, it, it, the whole thing. Um, well, in 2009, when I discovered I hadn't been promoted for the fourth time, going to senior lectureship, not professorship. Um, I kind of thought, what's, what's wrong here? And I asked the registrar who was giving me feedback, you know, uh, how many women were promoted? And it was one out of 17. So I thought, right, there's something wrong here. And it's then that I thought, you know, some people might be worried about, you know, what their family would think if they were to step outside. You know, I thought, God, what would my grandparents and parents say if I didn't? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're there, kind of, you know, yeah. go. And also, I thought, well, I'll take the case, and at least it'll get a headline: suffragette's granddaughter takes case. You know, yeah. and I had no idea, you know, how to go about it, or even what was there. And then, one long battle, it, it, it took a while. I went to the Equality Tribunal because I was within the time frame, six months, and you know, it was toing and froing over four years. It was 2012 before I actually three years, 2012 before I actually had the hearing, and I had six weeks to prepare my case. In that, it was only six weeks before the hearing that I got everybody's application form, you know, of the 30 of us. Remember, yeah. there were 30 of us, men and women, who were shortlisted and deemed suitable, and the top 17 got promoted. I had first learned that the 17th was the woman, 16 men. So it was when I saw that I realised that there was a hell of a lot wrong, and I was able to build a whole case and did a spreadsheet, and, and that's, you know, where I, I just... Obviously, I suppose... I had the time, I knew about it, signed a spreadsheet, Excel, put it all out. And I asked the university, kind of, where's your, sp how did you evaluate me against, how did you, I just got three marks. That was the other thing under FOI, I got freedom of information, I didn't get any information as to how they came to the conclusion that I got three marks for teaching, contribution to society and for research, that we all got three marks. How did they give me those three? No explanation. So, you know, and then I did this evaluation sheet, and again, where was their spreadsheet, you know, out of the 30? So it's just building that. It took the quality officer two years to write up the, the conclusion, but she really did pull out a lot of the points I was making. So in the end, I mean, and only recently in the, in the Times the other day, it, it was misquoted. It said I was a single case against a, a single man who wasn't eligible. Fake news, folks. <laughs> Yes, there was a guy who wasn't eligible. There were, there were six other guys who were also mentioned as being deficient in areas that I was better at. You know, I had a PhD. One man, number one, hadn't got a PhD in deficiencies in teaching. And it was basically what they were doing was they were rewarding people who brought in money and who increased the profile of the university because the then President Jim Brown wanted to increase the rankings. And this rankings thing is all about this financial thing and profile. Right, yeah, it's all about yeah. money at the end yeah, of the, the day. You are it's the not about training your students. It's not about training. Educare means to draw out yeah. people, to draw out students for the future. And you know. Since your ruling, have things changed? Can you see any change happening? I'm not terribly, you know, I think yes. For one, like when I, I, I won that and then I realised as I did it, there were five other women like me who had PhDs, had met all the guidelines, should have been promoted ahead of those women. So I, I told them that. They couldn't see all the details. I said, look, you really, you know, can, could qualify. And it's them taking their cases. They went, one went to the Labour Court and the other to the High Court. It's them doing that that actually kept the campaign. Because if I had just won, it would have been, you know, one week wonder and that's it. But they did. And of course, 
as in many things, the intransigence of Jim Brown and the university meant that the whole thing dragged on for four years. And so there was a bit of change. They brought in a task force. We've got the first to bring in a task force to look at this. Then the Higher Education Authority brought in a task force, and it was quite hard-hitting, chaired by Maura Gagan Quinn. So I think, yes, that has brought in, brought the attention. And I think it has come It shows the gradual that Mary Mitchell Mitchell was talking about. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it, it does keep it in. But, you know, it was hard graft, and, you know, it was constantly trying to dodge and get in, information. And at the end of the day, has it changed a lot? You know, and we need to widen out society. I mean, this is only women being promoted in academic yeah. sphere. That's fairly yeah. privileged. And you, but and universities that, have been there for 100 years and women have been in universities for 100 years. So it just yeah. shows you the, the, the And actually, someone the who are, maybe I won't name, but we, you know, oh, there was well. fight well. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, the vice president for equality and diversity who got a new job at 106 grand a year. They couldn't afford to promote the women, but they appointed her. Said we, it took us 100 years to get where we are today we mustn't be too impatient mm. <laughs> Helen, Helen the, the gender gap in Britain mm. how long will it be before it's closed I saw a shocking statistic in that there book yeah I mean the horrific I, I think it's 60 years or something that they were saying 2069 or something yeah, yeah. why but, what, uh, what's because the, the layers of the onions, all the different forms of these inequality that superimpose upon each other, you know, I think that people just live in their own bubble and they're aware of the ones that are around them. But actually, all of these take place in so many different ways. I mean, in the UK, we've had this gender pay gap reporting uh, process. I don't know whether it's um, been uh, taken on in Ireland as well. I don't think so. Has it? Gender pay gap reporting? Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 It yeah. has? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's beginning to yield quite a lot of interesting data. Yeah. And it's been hilarious how initially the first few people reporting on a gender pay gap would say, well, you know, we're, we're sorry, but it's just that the men are the pilots and the women are the cabin crew, and that's why we have a gender pay gap. Oh, right. And I mean, literally, that was their initial arguments. And I mean, gradually, they're realising that there's something majorly problematic with that very same explanation. Right. So I think the spotlight, the continued spotlight, I think people... I, mean, I talk in the book, and I think for me this is quite a useful structure, is that there are three aspects of change. There's agency, i.e. the individual saying, I'm going to call this out, I'm going to do something. And we all have to have that agency and use it. There's social norms change, and that's enough people changing the society, the traditions. And that's enough people saying, listen, it can be better. And then there's structural or institutional change, the law, the vote, and things like that. And the closer we can link those three aspects, the more we can see how we can put those together to enact change, it's fine. But just waiting for policy change without social norms is not going to get us anywhere. Just a few people with agency isn't going to get us anywhere. It ha- we have to pull those three together. Okay, and I know in the afternoon session you're going to talk about women in politics. Well, one of the, the things that struck me as well as I was preparing for today was that the vote was granted to women over 30 in 2018, Countess Markovic being the first Irish woman elected to Parliament. But it made the point that not all women voted for her, which we talked earlier, because the politics were different. Um, It does bring up this question, do women necessarily vote for women? It depends who they are as well, I think. I mean, I would vote for women if I agree with their politics. (laughs) You know, so it's... Yes, you would want to promote your, your female TD, but it doesn't, yeah. that isn't the only thing. So personally, I would you know, mostly vote for women, yeah. but not because yeah. necessarily. So yeah, they don't. But yeah, and, and just to come back to the, those elections, uh, I mean, Sinn Féin returned over 70 seats, and yet there was only one woman returned. Hannah was offered a seat in North Antrim, which to this day has never been won by Sinn Féin. So the women were already taken out of that. You know, mm-hmm. the men were making the decisions. We won the power. Mm-hmm. And that's coming back to, you know, how do you get over that? You know, how do you empower people? And yes, you, you need to have more women in power so that you can see that this is yeah. possible. And the diversity of women, I think that's the other important thing. And how did you find when you were going through your, your, um, your campaign in NUIG, did you get a lot of support from the women yeah. that you work with? Yeah, yeah, a lot. I mean, people were a little bit wary of the whole thing if they were employees. But I know when I won the case, a lot of the the buildings and ground staff and admin staff said, well done. And I think that's also really important to say. The gender pay gap, the the people in the universities, in in admin, in the the one-hour contract, all of that is dominated by women. That's why you've got the pay gap. So women are still at the bottom. And I really want to remind people of that because, yeah, okay, we, you know, the professorships and that is important, but let's have a look at what women are having to put up with. Let's look at how women have to leave academia just 
to focus on like a new because they can't afford to stay in these short contract things. So yeah, those people in particular were supportive because they saw it as a chink in the armor, you know, trying to get it at that. Some of some of the senior staff didn't say much or would walk past me. Yeah. <laughs> just, there, is, there is that idea that, that you mentioned a while ago that um, you know the status quo. Some people just just like the status quo and they don't want to change. I mean that that aspect is going to have to change for us to to move on. We're going to have to kick the status quo. Yeah. I mean, interestingly, in Parliament uh, in, in Westminster, there, a lot of the women MPs are saying that for the first time there's greater coordination and mutual support than there has been in the past, that something is beginning to shift. And I think it's around understanding that you can differ around your political um, views, but... Uh, there is still this collective as women and the whole structure is still man-made and if you want to change that man-made structure you have to work together and we're beginning to see that furthermore there is a moment now when there's stronger coordination not just between the parties but also between civil society and even some women in the media saying come on let's come together um, and if you have media on board which you know let's face it has perpetuated you know so much of the problem perpetuated the idea that it's what women look like not what they say or do that matters you know, if you have a media that's also creating these schism, that doesn't help. But if we have some women on the media, some feminists in the media, starting with a different uh, perspective on things, if you've got social society, if you've got civil society, if you've got women in organisations such as, you know, the 50-50 campaign mm. here beginning to uh, work together and you have women across parties doing so, maybe, just maybe, the pace of change could change. OK. Well, uh, I'm going to take some questions from the audience now because I'm sure a lot of you have questions and we, we will go back to some chat. But I'd like to um, get some of your questions in. Uh, so put up your hand. I don't know if there's a roving microphone or whatever, but uh, do you have a microphone, Noreen? Yeah. Oh, great. OK. Right. So has anybody got a question for um, either of our two panellists here? Don't be shy. I'll tell you, okay, there's, there's one over here. Uh, uh, thanks very much for an absolutely inspirational uh, talk. I really enjoyed it. I just wondered, did either of these women ever meet? I'm sorry, I didn't. I don't know if they'd ever met. Interesting. I, I've been trying to find out. I, Sylvia came over several times to Ireland, and I was reading excerpts. Uh, someone kindly sent me some of them of the Irish Citizen, and there's lots of comments, particularly about Sylvia and applauding her for what she's doing and her social action and all that. But I haven't yet seen the actual proof. They must have met, and, and maybe some historians know they spoke on the same platform. Certainly, Sylvia spoke in Dublin, but I think Anna was in prison at the time. <laughs> So, uh, you know, the, the, uh, I don't actually know how much there was interaction. I've never seen letters in the family papers. I haven't been through all the family papers. It's an enormous amount. Um, but it's intriguing to know, did they meet? Another hand up at the back there. Hi, I just want to say uh, that... I <coughs> You know, listening to you talking about your grannies and uh, that the parallels, they haven't been involved in the review the Yankee campaign and just history keeps repeating itself, you know, and there's so much to learn. It's, it's just I feel we're standing on these women's shoulders. They stood on other women's shoulders. And, you know, that there's so many links with them and there's so much that we can learn now from them, from them, from that time as well. Um, and I just have, you know, we're standing on their shoulders. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. much of, um, I suppose, uh, do you feel that you have to continue on the legacy? How, how big a burden is it having somebody like uh, Sylvia and indeed Emmeline and Christabel in your background? Yeah. Um, it's been a joy. I mean, I was brought up in Ethiopia and for me, uh, I, I used to come to the UK during the summer and it was then that adults would say to me, you know, oh, that surname, are you related? And then I'd say yes and gradually I had to learn what yes meant. I, I need to understand more and more as I grew up. But it wasn't something that I uh, heard all the time. So I was a little bit protected from it, from being there, from being away from it. But I do remember... Um, that very early on questioning gender inequality and in particular it was in Ethiopia you see women carrying uh, wood and water on their backs and this is 
back-breaking work. This is really hard work. This is any work which any man would find very, very physically demanding. And yet, society said that women were weak. And I remember thinking, mm. this just doesn't make any sense. And then with that kind of personal experience and then the looking at the differences across different societies uh, in terms of these issues around gender, um, it, be it became important to me. And then I had this surname that meant that people would ask me questions about it. And then there were the schisms within the family. So I had to mm. explain and think about those differences. And also, and I think for me, what's been really important is to value the contribution of all the members of the family in their different ways and not to, not to cast, you know, not to be too negative about, and it's difficult not to be too negative about one family or other, because if we keep on doing that as women, if we keep on saying, well, this is the only way, and if we keep on throwing stones at other people and saying, well, that position is different, I think, I think we're perpetuating the problem. So a lot of lessons for me, as well as shouldering the, you know, the, the surname and the value, it's, it's helped me reflect about a lot of the issues, and I think that I can be a stronger campaigner as a consequence of all of that. Yeah. And Micheline, you said that um, Hannah did run for office. Did she ever hold office apart from I know no. she held office at local she, council level. Yeah she, she didn't Dublin? actually run that time in 1918 because she was disgusted at the fact that she was being sidelined. She said I haven't a hope in hell of getting that seat. I've been away for 18 months and I'm not going to waste my time on this. You know and I think she was right in that sense. So she was because there had been talk of her running in Dublin but the men said I think she could do a lot of good for us at the North East <laughs> So you know so she never did actually run for um, well, she did eventually in, in the 40s later in life. They had a women's party um, mm -hmm. and they ran. And the comment was, as we know today, they didn't have a big party machine and finances behind them because they were a small group. And so they didn't get the support that they might have liked. And I think that still stands today. If you're not in a big party, it's very hard to break into it. And this was quite a new thing. Yeah. So that's the only time she went for office. She was a councillor. She was a city on the city. She was the, one of the first four women to be elected to Dublin City Council. And as a suffragette, she was not. A, was she a member of any political party yeah. or not? Oh, she yeah. Was. She was in yeah. Sinn Féin. She joined Sinn Féin. She was on the executive in 1918. Right. So did no. she see what she was doing as parallel to politics? or No, she was. So she was quite, I mean, she was very, uh, even more politicised, I think, after the murder of Frank. She, was, she became more Republican. She, had, she was political in that sense. She wanted independence. She was against the treaty. Right. So it's just she didn't get to be a TD. She didn't get to be a parliamentarian. Yeah. And we tend to think that that's the only way that you can be political. But actually, you know, you can work in, in many different ways. And it's a shame. I mean... James Connolly offered her a ministership if had they succeeded in the, you know, okay. and we know the proclamation had total equality, and we also know how much women slid backwards when we got independence because, unfortunately, and I don't know how how much it would have happened between the leaders of the, of the revolution were much more socialist and inclusive and feminist than what remained, you know, and I often wonder what, what was it that changed things so radically from this proclamation to what we ended up taking women out of power and out of, you know, out of society. Yeah, yeah. And Helen, um, for Sylvia as well, obviously she was a member of the Socialist Party, so she was very political too. I suppose when you look at it now, as having looked at the last hundred years, do you have to be in politics to make a difference or is campaigning the way you do? Um, the way, say, for instance, uh, the, the previous two referendums here in Ireland on marriage equality and on abortion, um, they say it wasn't really politics that, that got those through, it was the people. Mm -hmm. Is there a different way of making a difference mm -hmm. now as a woman, or is politics still the main route? I think every single person can make a difference in their sphere of interest, experience, um, position. And if we just wait for the politicians to make the difference, we are losing the plot. Mm -hmm. Every single person, and it might be that for somebody it's through sports, for somebody it's through the way that they dress, for somebody, it, there are just so many ways in which we can express this idea of equality and diversity without a hierarchy inherent in that. And yes, political space is important, but I think there's so many other spaces that are equally so. We, every single one of us must vote. I mean, there's absolutely, thank you, I've said it. Every single one of us <laughs> must vote vote it's absolutely imperative because that is one way where we are a collective and it's important but it, it's no, not the only space of power by any means okay and just to go back to I suppose what would have always been considered you know one of the things holding women back is the fact that they have this whole role in the home and they are the mothers and 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 the carers um <laughs> 
Have you ever in, in your research come across this notion that women just don't spend enough time at the office, therefore that's why they're not getting the, the, the big positions? Yes, you hear that a, a lot, but the whole structure is wrong, isn't it? Because we are creating a division between work and home. Home becomes undervalued, work becomes valued. Um, and if we realise that the world is one in which both of those are there side by side. And therefore, if we reimagine work and we reimagine home and we understand that those are linked and understand that in families the best way of working is not to say that is more important than that. If economically we interlink those, then surely we would end up with a more effective thing. You know, so it, it, it's the fact that it's, the lens is wrong. The lens well, that says work... Do you see changes? It is changing, but it's yeah. changing still on the margin. The, the, the dominant narrative is still the traditional one. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's another. There are some questions here. Yeah, great. Yes. Hello, ladies. Honour to speak with you. Um, I just wondered. You spoke a bit about the media there as well, and maybe it's something Karen could jump in on about what correlation do you think the media has had to play in the advancement, or not, so to speak, um, of our rights? You mentioned the Irish suffragist um, newspaper. You know, is there something similar that we would believe would be here today that would be required, or you know, what kind of um, media influence do you think is there at the moment that is either sending us forward or, or keeping us happy? It's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, I remember when I when I grew up, there was always like a women's page in the newspaper, and going back looking at old Leitrim observers from the 1900s, there was uh, yeah, always the, the the women's page and the women's fashions and the women's lifestyle and all that. Um, I know in the, in the business I'm in, we don't specifically have any brief that uh, that covers women. You know, we have various briefs covering the environment, education, all of that. Nothing specifically uh, covering women. Um, maybe it is something that, that should be looked at. Um, it's, it's a bit like the quotas, though, I suppose. Some people say, well, why do we need them? Why aren't we just all assuming that we're equal and that you know, we don't need special attention? We don't need to be, to be drug up, as, a, as, as you put it. In America, they have the affirmative action, which you would know about as well in the, in the universities for, um, for minorities to get, you know, get minorities into universities and it's always been a bone of contention some of them like it some of them don't some of them just wanted to be treated you know equally they don't want to be singled out for special attention but um yeah i suppose all of us journalists could do better just in terms of um in highlighting the issues i mean housing at the moment i think is one of the big ones and uh, that that we would be working on and definitely i met a woman over the over the weekend whose housing situation is just Absolutely atrocious. A woman with, um, you know, six kids, and they're all living in, in one room. And it's definitely the women that bear the brunt of that. So we just keep highlighting, I suppose, the issues that that do affect women, the economic and housing issues. I suppose just to cut in, there was a, during the campaign, it was kind of frustrating not to be covered, and I could see why Frank founded his own newspaper because it's very hard. I mean, there were journalists who were silenced who were covering the campaign and mm. suddenly ceased to cover the campaign. And so I can't really say any more. Yeah. So it is hard. And I also even found just lately that, you know, you know, with all respect to the media, you get the, there's, there's a sensationalization. You know, the, the the big focus on the women professors. You know, the, mm. the, the quota, and then I'm asked to to comment on television, and they just cut everything I said to one soundbite, which completely took it out of context. You know, I do have reservations about female only professorships, but that wasn't, you know, I was saying about the, the other positions in the university and I was welcoming the fact that the minister is proactive and it was, yeah. sound bite, sensation, let's get something controversial you know, yeah. Yeah. that I really find very frustrating yeah. in the media yeah. Yeah. Also, I mean, just to build on it, I think the media is absolutely critical. It is, it is the lens through which citizen and the political establishment relate. You know, it, it mediates that relationship. So if the media isn't gender neutral, and it isn't, the way it focuses, the way uh, the power base within the media itself, I mean, in the UK, it's, I think, 6% um, uh, are lobbyists, political lobbyists. Only 6% of the media are women in terms of political lobbyists. So, you know, the, the whole structure is still problematic. But then add to it the story of social media. Now, in some, some ways, social media is ensuring an accountability of the media because it's diffusing the story. But the two work together in so many ways. You know, one feeds into the other. And then 
you have this distortion in social media as well. So if you use aggressive language in, in social media, it's the algorithms multiply that sound. Mm. So social media is also biased towards a story in which negotiation, collaboration, uh, nuance isn't given the same platform as anger and, and violence. And, mm. uh, and so how, how, do we, how, how do we move forward with a media that's representative of diversity? How do we move forward with a social media that encourages that and isn't aggressive? For me, those are critical questions. Okay. Um, just one other thought that came into my head. Just, I mean, I'm, I'm part of the mainstream media. Um, it is hard to get women to comment on a lot of stories. You know, we're always looking for balance in our programmes and it is harder to, to, to find women. So uh, I'm often not asked. <laughs> <laughs> from here in terms of campaigning what are the most effective ways of campaigning for the issues that are important to women and particularly I think we just briefly touched on the violence against women issue which I think is a big one that just it just refuses to, to, to go away, it's, it's with us and it will be with us I think we have to have um, sector specific campaigns so I think we have to have campaigns on political representation um, we have to have campaigns on economic um, equality, gender pay gap uh, reporting. We have to have campaigns that address even things that might seem really silly and minor. To give you an example, um, I was in a, uh, 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 I was talking in a, somewhere, and a woman stood up and she said, "I have a son and a daughter. The son has got pockets. The daughter doesn't have pockets." And she said, "You might think that's silly, but the fact is, symbolically, you're starting so young, and you know, I mean, even without the pinkification and the difference in the clothes and the difference in the messaging on the clothes, you know, we need campaigns that say, in all these." minute ways we are perpetuating gender norms that are about inequality and subordination in terms of women's position let's challenge those um, so I think that there have to be specific um, campaigns and people with energy and anger around those need to do things and then we need to come together because this is also about the understanding that these things are interlinked um, and that we can't just resolve this one issue at a time Okay, more questions please um, there's a challenge with all the different world religions that underpin inequality and promote second-rate treatment of females. This needs to change somehow to improve women's respect. Um, absolutely, just a quick comment on that. Apparently, Emmeline was once asked what God made of her antics, to which her response was, I'm sure she would approve. <laughs> Please. Yeah, here in the front row. Hi, um, I just have a, a question about, uh, well, before we get in, we have that little um, terminal out in the foyer, and one of the things that um, was in the, in the speech by the first um, lady who spoke, she spoke about how that children were being molested by men, and they couldn't even accompany them into court. There was that, and I thought, we're 100 years on and that's still happening. And brought to mind the recent thing of the, um, the underwear being um, introduced in, in a court of law. And I'm just wondering, do you have any thoughts on... It was a female who raised that. Now, yes, she has a duty of care to her client where she has you know, to provide the, the best defence or whatever. But do you think that she should be censured by the law society? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. so why are she doing that? Because basically, she was in, she was it was specific to women. So do, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Michelle, mm. well, yeah, it was, it's, it's outrageous, really. The judiciary are terribly male hierarchical, yeah. and and I, I I I don't know about the whole thing. I think you should. Condemn it anyway. I don't know about the official ways of censoring it, but 
I, again, time and again, you see women taking on the role of men, and the whole, you know, in the legal system, I've seen female barristers, and they have to be really kind of aggressive and tough, and you know, as much as the men. Why does that kind of system have to function like that? And it's it, there's a need to break that down, and it translates down into the social injustices, to the sentences for rape, to the whole thing about hearing about the, you know, all of that has to change. And so, yeah, that's only a, a minor thing to condemn what she does, but it is shocking that women, and I, I could have cited other cases of, of, of women, female, you know, solicitors, barristers, whatever, doing that. So. Yeah, we need to highlight that and make a big change. And it's true that female barristers, don't, don't they wear this, the very same um, wigs and yeah. gowns as the male barristers? There was one thing that I did notice when I was uh, researching for today is that the, the suffragettes, by and large, although Hannah wore her graduation gown, um, they didn't want to dress as men, you know, carrying cudgels or guns or anything. They wanted their femininity to, to come through, and that was an important part of it. They weren't saying, we want to be a man, we, want, we just want equal rights uh, as a woman. How did your ancestors, do, have you ever looked into their, yeah. their dress? Yes, I mean, there was a lot of focus on looking feminine, um, to, partly to counter the obvious repost from the, 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 the establishment, which is, you know, they're, they're ugly, they're they're, they're man haters. They're they're horrible. All of that. So they wanted to be very feminine, female, and say, look, we value this. But the way we dress, uh, it uh, counterpoised in, in these marches. You counterpoise the femininity with male marches. I mean, it's very cleverly done. And a lot of use of Im- of uh, feminine images and imagery, understanding the power of color. I mean, you know, the fact that these three colors of um, purple, white, and green becoming universal symbols of feminism globally. So the power of merchandising as well. I mean, the teacups uh, as as beautiful um, uh, ways in which you can communicate. So m- use feminine ideas and masculine ideas and put those two together in a campaign, which is fundamentally what they're saying about the world and about <laughs> everything. Put those two ideas together. doesn't mean to say everybody has to b- behave and dress in a certain way. A lot of the suffragettes actually were at the forefront of thinking about gender identities and dress up as men and you know that that was fine but also they wanted to value the feminine put the two together allow a spectrum of what you are who you are okay. beginning of thinking in those ways can we just come down the front here for a second just and then two, i'll go back up there two yeah, comments go just ahead. one the irish suffrage colors are green and orange Yes, they were specifically green and orange as a nationalist statement. So, uh, you know, I pick you up on that. It is true that people think, you know, suffrage is green and purple, and, and it, but it, Irish ones were different. And actually, the American was purple and yellow. Yeah. Um, but also, I, I gather, and I read somewhere, there's that image which was shown here of the, the women in Hyde Park and the, and the Irish suffrage movement, and it said the Irish women, unlike the English, did not wear uniforms. And I didn't. I don't know what that's a reference to, but I have a funny feeling that the Irish women actually didn't wear the sashes. Okay. And I don't know if they meant that or not. I'd like to know a bit more about that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the sashes, if they had worn them, would have been green, white, and orange. Yes. Okay. Um, I just like to ask: um, Do you think there's a certain inevitability about equality, or do you think there's actually a possibility of reversal, uh, in the sense that? Um, People complain about that it's too slow, that it'll take up to 20, 60, whatever, uh, to get equality. But actually, nobody actually contemplates that perhaps there might be a reversal. Uh, is there an inevitability about this onward march towards equality? So my view on that is fundamentally there isn't an inequality. In, in, inevitability about it. You look around the world and you look at countries where there had been so much progress in terms of equality and things go back. And I think we assume progress at our peril. We really, really do. I'd like to read one quote. This is from Mitch, who was a prison governor. uh, And she she says... Change can be sometimes of the elastic band kind. Mm-hmm. You take the strain and stretch forward for progress. You begin to see real change, new motivations, a future. And then you ease the pressure. You tire, you're moved on to the new post. Maybe you think you've got there. Vital funding is cut. And the elastic band does what it does best. It snaps back to its original shape. Mm-hmm. So you just can't let up the pressure, can't relax, can't ever believe the job is done. And that's the mistake that feminists and feminist institutions make believing that an issue is solved, that it's okay to take your eye off the ball. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Okay. Hi, ladies. Um, I just have a question about advice for 
for younger generations of campaigners fighting for whatever cause it is that they want. What advice would you give to the younger generation about fighting for their causes? Well, in short, I can elaborate, go for it. <laughs> um, my father used to quote, because he became a senator, and he, I think he lived out, you know, his parents' lives obviously were quite tragic, and he lived out that, I think. And my grandfather's thing was, for men and women equally, the rights of citizenship. From men and women equally, the duties of citizenship. We all have a duty to exercise the rights that we have. We have a duty to help people who have less of a voice. So, in other words, what little you can do, and that's the other thing, he used to quote Herbert Spencer and say, no matter, I must realise that even if it's, however infinitesimal the thing is that I can do, it's infinitely important I should do it. So, you might think you're not going to make a difference. You might only have a small thing, and I didn't think I was going to make a difference, but... I had the wherewithal to, to do it. I didn't care too much about my promotion prospects or that. So if you can, you do something. If you see an injustice, speak out. Don't feel kind of that you're going to be criticised for it. You have to say something. So that's on a very personal level, and obviously coming together as groups and you know. But once you speak out, you find someone else is of the same opinion, and you already kind of have a, a maybe common cause with people. Yeah, I would add, um, be braver. Use that as a kind of, as a as a motto because I think it's very easy just to default to saying oh well it doesn't really matter but I think if you if you're consciously about it, being braver, the second is by doing something you might not be changing the world but you're changing your relationship with the world, and I think that's fundamentally important. You're just not being passive. You're saying I care and I will do something, and I think that's really important. And then thirdly, my my motto is fun and purpose. <laughs> and that's about actually when you engage in these things you're not just doing things but you're having fun you're believing in something you're coming together with others and I think as a youngster doing something like that is so much more interesting than just letting life go by maybe that's what they were up to back in Indeed. the 1910s <laughs> yeah. having fun okay um, I, I'm um, just very struck by the fact that you have who was very involved working as in Manchester mm-hmm. and I think London. And I think once helped to unseat Winston Churchill over over yeah. uh, the conditions of work or the possibility of bar bar women continuing to work in bars or something like that. So very similar. So I'm just wondering, did they meet? Did they work together? <coughs> Yeah, Eva Goldbooth and, and uh, the Pankhurst very closely. I think, um, actually, despite being politically more aligned to Sylvia, they worked more closely with Christabel, if I remember correctly. But um, th- th- I know that they were strong links. Yeah. Very good. More questions? We have room for a couple more. Um, hello. It's uh, lovely to hear you uh, speak today. I was just wondering, um, sometimes the word feminism can be used against people and sort of seen as like a dirty word to use sometimes and I was just wondering and it can be people can be seen as um, cannot be heard because of it their points of view is there any way we can still do you have any advice of how we can still stand for what we believe in while getting across our message to people who see us that way yeah. So, um, you know, the suffragettes were made, were, the term was given to them as a derogatory one by the Daily Mail. They took it on board. They said, I'm going to own this. I'm going to um, value it and not be, uh, not, 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 not take on that term. I feel strongly the same about the term feminism. You know, that if you can't even own that word without it being taken away from you in negative ways, that, show, that in itself shows that there's a problem. And the very first thing that you can do is own that term and not feel... Um, you know, if you can't even own the term, then how can you take action in those ways? And society will always find a way of minimising it and diminishing it for as long as society still reflects a different ideology. So you might call yourself something else and then that term will be taken away from you. So I think you have to just own it. Make sure that you ask those people who say, well, feminism is a, is a dirty word. Why is it? What, are the, what does feminism mean? And as soon as you start unpicking it, very few... Well, you'll, I think you get more people on 
on board. And I think also to ensure that what it is to be a feminist looks and feels different for different people. And I think that diversity of ideas about what feminism is, again, feminism in action as, a, as a, somebody who believes in sport, and not necessarily a card-carrying feminist who's out there in the marches. You can be a quiet feminist, you can be all sorts of feminists. And I think making that visible in, in all spaces is a way of diffusing um, the seeing it in very narrowly uh, socially constructed ways. Okay. Yeah. Well, just to, yeah, to say, it is. There's often there's a kind of fine line between you know people say I'm not a feminist, but, but yeah. <laughs> uh, and because you're kind of afraid of standing up and saying that, and there's a fine line between kind of engaging with people who don't agree with you and maybe not giving them oxygen. And I think there in social media, there's so much stuff, and sometimes it's just look, I'm not going to waste my time with these people. I'm going. I am a feminist. I'm proud of being a feminist, and I'm going to keep speaking out. So, but to to kind of find your way between challenging somebody and just saying, look, I, that somebody's just speaking out because they want to be heard, and maybe we don't want them to be heard. It's not looking too far across the water to the west of us. <laughs> <laughs> you have another one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when you want to uh, punch um, a target instead of hitting it, you need to. Uh, basically think that you're hitting behind it. Like when I was a child I mean, the idea of 50-50 equality was like, you know, really a speaking thing. I just really could see it. But I mean, as I grew up, I realized that, you know, the whole system is basically built on sexism and colonialism and racism and everything. So, so like, what, if we were, can we hit, can we be trying to hit 50-50? Can, can we get anything on a system that's basically built on, you know, keeping women at home, keep, keeping the core for keeping you know the resources into the hands of, of a few. Like I'm not, I don't think I mean you know I, I'm delighted to be at an event like this and I think it's important but I think if we're just trying to aim to 50 50 50 we're going nowhere. Yeah, well, that goes to what Marion Harkin said in her speech about changing the structure. Mm-hmm. And that's, I suppose, that's the difficult part, I suppose, mm-hmm. isn't it? Yeah, I mean, your key word there was just. Well, it's not just. That's only one thing. And you want to change the, you know, the hierarchy. The whole feminism is about inclusivity. It's about sustainability. It's about the environment. I'm an ecologist, so I see it as much more than just... 50-50. But the more women that get in, the more, as I say, diversity. I don't necessarily agree with all the women who are in the hierarchy and have got into power. But the more of us that are there, the more we have a voice, which is a different voice, and we have different ways of working together. And I think that's really important to keep, to bear that in mind. That it's not just 50-50. Um, I believe that Sean McDermott and uh, a later man, oh, <laughs> and, uh, he shared a cell with your grandfather, Francis Sheehy Skeffington, and who told him uh, um, about the power of uh, hunger strikes and the, uh, that the suffragette movement um, used as one of their tools, and then that uh, Sinn Féin in um, the 80s used in uh, Northern Ireland. So I just want you to say, uh, I believe that that is true, that they shared um, a cell in 1915. Did you know that? Oh, well, I knew they were t- in prison. I'm not sure if they shared a cell, but certainly they, they were in prison together because Frank had been arrested for his speeches against war. McDermott was in for another reason. McDermott comments on it, all right. But yeah, he was, you know, Frank would have been, he was on hunger strike, you know, so he, I don't know how long they, because Frank wasn't in prison that long because he went on thirst strike soon after hunger strike. So he was released after about six days because he would have died, you know. The other thing I noticed at the time, uh, a heightened uh, political thing is um, Brexit and the number of women in the uh, leading political parties, Theresa May, uh, the um, uh, Sinn Féin in Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, mm-hmm. the lady in the uh, Conservative Scottish Party and in um, uh, SNP. I'm just wondering at a time uh, now, at come to brinksmanship or whatever, 
uh, what do you think of women in political parties and Brexit now? <laughs> so she's asking you, when women get the power, <laughs> can, can, can they deliver? I well, let's get back to what I'm saying. I don't necessarily agree with all the women with the power, you know, but it's good to have women there. And, may, and maybe Theresa May, for all I disagree with her politics, is holding something together that maybe a man might not, uh, less ego. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know, but it, it, it is about, you know, let's have more up there. I don't necessarily have much affinity with a lot of the women leaders, yeah, yeah. but it is nice to see them there. It is nice to show that, yes, actually, we can run things. Yeah, and the, the midterm elections in America as well have uh, yeah. put in a lot of women. So um, yeah. and just, just in relation to Theresa May, somebody said during the week, well, she's some woman for one woman, which is an <laughs> interesting. Well, what do you think about that idea of, um, you know, the fact that we are seeing, at least in our geographical area, we are seeing women at the top at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I, um, Michelle Bachelet used to say some uh, women in politics changes women, many women in politics changes politics. We've not got to changing politics no. yet. Okay. Mm. Okay, have we one more question and then we leave it there because yes. I bet people are getting hungry. Good afternoon, ladies. Um, just actually adding on to um, your comments and the previous question. We in this country are at a cusp of election season. We're coming into local next year, the Whisper to General, and of course Europe. Um, can I ask, just for your all your historical content and, and looking into the future, um, how do we continue on that momentum of the previous referendums, making sure people are getting out to vote? Like what is your advice to just, from, for younger generations or any age demographic, how do we continue on getting people, particularly women, onto the tickets and then out of their homes to vote? I think it's most important, based on the momentum we have in Irish society. I mean, right now it seems that you've had a few successes in terms of uh, these ideas of diversity and that change can happen. It feels sometimes, uh, uh, actually we were having a conversation uh, last night about in Ireland sometimes it seems that nothing is changing, nothing is changing, nothing is changing, it's absolutely paralysed and then it changes. So, you know, where, where you're on this crest, crest of, who am I to say, but it seems like you're on this crest of change and maybe so much more could change like that as well. So I think it's hanging in there. It's, um, for me, fundamentally, it's keeping the networks up, the networks amongst you horizontally and vertically across different types of organisations, across all the differences in society, because I think that that power base and the difference of, of um, different ways in which you can support each other is, is absolutely paramount. And just perseverance, if there's one thing that suffragettes knew a lot about, it was about perseverance. Mm. And I suppose just, you know, Brexit is another case. The younger generation were totally against it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and the last two referenda in Ireland, you know. So there is a kind of momentum of kind of need to change and empowerment. And I'd hope that, the, that people would see that as some way of galvanizing it into, into change in terms of political things. Okay, well, on that reasonably optimistic note, <laughs> I'm going to say thank you to both of you. And, oh, you go for